and welcome to week 5, part 1 of EGM 703, Principles of Ground Penetrating Radar. In this lesson, we'll learn about how we can use radar and microwaves to study what's under the ground beneath our feet. Over the rest of the week, we'll spend some time looking at different applications of GPR, starting with archaeology, followed by glaciology, and then finishing off with a number of other applications. In week three, we discussed the principles of microwave remote sensing. One of the topics that we covered in those lessons is the electric permittivity, specifically how the electric permittivity determines how electromagnetic radiation interacts with a particular material, including how well it is able to penetrate into that material. As you might have guessed, this is one of the key concepts that underpins ground penetrating radar. In order to understand or interpret what we're seeing, we need to have some understanding of how the GPR signal interacts with the material. One of the ways that the dielectric properties affect what we see with GPR is the speed at which the signal travels through the material. Now we've spent most of our time considering how electromagnetic radiation propagates through the air, which is not so different from a vacuum that we've had to worry much about the difference. With materials that aren't air, though, we do have to start worrying about this. For a number of materials that we might use GPR to see through, we can consider them to be low-loss, non-magnetic materials. That is, we neglect the magnetic permittivity and the uh, imaginary part of the electric permittivity. And in that case, the speed that the signal travels through the material is given by the speed of light in a vacuum, C0, divided by the square root of the real part of the electric permittivity, or the dielectric constant. And you can see here that as the electric permittivity increases, the speed will decrease. That is, the signal is going to slow down. In addition to slowing down, the signal can also lose energy to a number of different factors, including scattering or reflection, attenuation or absorption by the material, or spreading. Remember that the radar signal expands outwards in a sort of shell as it travels, and so the amount of energy in one small section of that shell becomes smaller as the shell expands. As an electromagnetic wave travels through a material, or from one material to another, the electric permittivity may change. When this happens, part of the signal is going to be reflected or scattered, and part of the signal will be transmitted. However, because the propagation speed depends on the electric permittivity, the speed will also change, which is going to cause refraction. Some of the different cases that we might see are if we have individual scatterers within a medium, for example, pebbles or rocks buried in soil, and this can also happen as we change from one material to another, for example, from dry soil to saturated soil. At the boundary between the two materials, we're going to see reflection or ordered scattering. As we've seen in other examples, the angle of reflection is going to be equal to the incident angle. Part of the signal will be transmitted, but at a different angle to the incident angle. The size of this angle is determined by something called Snell's Law, and it depends on the relative properties of the two materials. In general, for electromagnetic radiation, the refractive index, N, is determined by the square root of the products of the relative electric and magnetic permittivities. And as we'll discuss later on, the larger the contrast in dielectric properties between the two materials, the stronger the reflection. If the materials are largely similar, then we don't see very strong reflections. Like we've discussed with regular radar, the basic idea behind ground penetrating radar is that we send out a signal and measure how long it takes to come back. The basic setup looks something like this. We have a transmitting antenna, which actually sends out the signal, and a receiving antenna, which receives and records the signal that comes back. Most modern GPR instruments send out a frequency modulated or chirped signal, just like we've seen with satellite-based radar sensors. This signal then reflects off of internal horizons or scatterers within the material. How long it takes depends on the depth. So we'll see reflections from shallow surfaces or scatterers like this, as well as reflections from deeper surfaces. Depending on the instrument, we might also see air waves or surface ground waves, 
Some, but not all, instruments are insulated to help mitigate these. We could also see lateral waves, or reflected waves, that are refracted. And just like with satellite-based radars, the receiving antenna records the amplitude and two-way travel time of the signal. And we can use this, along with an estimate of the material's dielectric properties, to work out the depth of the different objects that cause the reflection. So the image that we receive is known as a radargram. And we'll see some examples of what these look like later on, but first we'll have a look at how we actually form them. So like we saw with imaging radars, we can move the transmitter or receiver array to create a two-dimensional image. So if we have our instrument on the surface here, it sends out a signal like this. When it reflects off of a scatterer, the receiving antenna will record the signal like this. Now, if we move the array and send out another signal, notice how the apparent distance between the object and the antenna has changed. Instead of intersecting with the radar beam all the way down here, we're now seeing a reflection much higher up, more like about here or so. And you can see that as we move our instrument array, this apparent depth is going to continue to change, even though the object itself does not move. So in the end, our radar image of this single object is going to trace out a shape like this. A scatterer traces out a hyperbolic shape in a radar gram, precisely because of how the radar beam intersects the object's location as the instrument is moving. So point scatterers trace out a hyperbolic shape in the radar gram, centered over top of the scatterer. The returns from surfaces can be a bit more complex though. Pause the video here and think about what type of scatterer might make this unimpressed looking turtle face. So it turns out that this is a simulated radar gram created using a semi semicircular trench shaped boundary between two different materials. And you can see from the diagram here how the different ray patterns can combine to make this pattern. So we can see the traces of the bottom trench below the flat section here. So when the transmitter is over here, the signal is going to be bouncing off of the wall of the trench over here and coming back, which means it's going to take much longer. It's going to appear like it's below the initial return, which is directly beneath the, um, directly beneath the antenna. Over the central part of the trench, we see how much stronger the returns from the trench are and how we can barely see the sides of the trench owing to how the geometry causes and focuses the reflections. In addition to the geometry, the amount of reflection that we see depends on the dielectric contrast between the two materials. This equation is an approximation that applies for most of the circumstances that we might encounter. Effectively, the fraction of reflection is the normalized difference of the square roots of the electric permittivities of the two materials. Now, what we see with GPR, again, depends on the contrast. If we have similar properties, then we have a much harder time distinguishing between them because we don't see very strong reflections. Another thing we might like to know about is the resolution of our GPR system. That is, how well we can distinguish between different objects. Similar to satellite-based radar, where we distinguish between range and azimuth resolution, we think about this in terms of objects separated vertically and horizontally. The vertical resolution of a GPR system is a function of the pulse width of the signal, W, and the speed of the signal through the material. You can see how this is directly analogous to the range resolution of radar. In an absolute best case scenario, the vertical resolution is going to be the wavelength of the signal divided by four. So as the wavelength increases or the frequency decreases, the resolution also decreases. The horizontal resolution or the ability to distinguish between objects that are separated by a horizontal distance also depends on the pulse width and propagation speed as well as the depth. As D increases, our ability to distinguish between objects that are separated horizontally decreases.
Again, this is similar to azimuth resolution for a real aperture radar system. You might also see the horizontal resolution related to the sensor footprint, which is approximately elliptical. The length of the semi-major axis, A, depends on the wavelength of the signal, the electric permittivity, and the depth. The length of the semi-minor semi axis, B, is just half of the length of the semi-major axis. Unfortunately, GPR is not without limitations. One of the major issues is that due to the attenuation of the radar signal, the maximum depth that we can observe is heavily dependent on the frequency of the signal. Low frequency signals, that is signals that have longer wavelengths, can see deeper than high frequency signals, that is things with shorter wavelengths. But as we saw on the previous slide, the resolution is exactly the opposite. The lower the frequency, the lower the resolution of the signal. So this means that there's a trade-off between how deep we can see and the resolution of what it is that we can see. Another limitation of GPR is in materials that have a high conductivity. The higher the conductivity of the material, the less signal penetration we have. In soils that have a lot of clay or brackish or saltwater conditions, GPR is much less useful. Finally, we have to think about the grid spacing. Depending on our instrument, covering a large area with a dense grid can be very difficult, meaning that we may not be able to map large areas in high resolution. Though, as we see in the coming lessons, technology is making some improvements in this area. In this lesson, we've discussed how electromagnetic waves can penetrate into different materials like the ground, though how deep and what we can see with ground penetrating radar depends on the material's dielectric properties. Because of this, we can study both internal structures, such as the different layers of sediment or soil, or the location of different buried objects. The success of GPR mostly depends on the frequency of radar that we use, as well as the properties of the materials that we're observing. You can read more about the topics we've discussed here in some of the following links. The first one here, Geophysics for Practicing Geoscientists, provides a great comprehensive overview of GPR and other geophysical methods and includes Jupyter notebooks with some exercises that you can use to examine how different physical parameters affect what you see with the GPR. There are also a few other papers linked here uh, in this, or in the Zotero library that provide a good background on the fundamentals. And finally, these two videos from the Jamestown Rediscovery Project show both a GPR survey in action and explain how the GPR findings relate to the archaeology of the site. That's all for this lesson. I hope you found it interesting, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me or post in the discussion forum on Blackboard. Bye!